Okay, without further ado then, I'm going to welcome our awesome speaker, Kathy Fulton. Kathy is a fibre artist, a travel blogger, and the author of Dream, Plan and Travel, which is uh, your guide to independent travel on a budget, which is her book. In 2017, at the age of 63, she set out on what was supposed to be a six month trip, which included walking the Camino de Santiago, hiking in Scotland, finding other knitters and spinners throughout Northern Europe. 13 months later, she found herself in Estonia and not ready to return home. So she continued east to Kyrgyzstan, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, and then on to South America and completed an around the world trip in two years instead of six months. She's now a full-time nomad without a permanent home. And you're joining us from New Orleans today, aren't you, Cathy? That's New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on her website, blog and YouTube channel, Kathleen's Odyssey, Cathy loves, loves to share her methods of how she travels, hoping to inspire others to take that first step outside of their comfort zone and embark on their own odyssey. I think today's going to be really inspiring. Um, she's recently written a series of articles entitled Look Over My Shoulder, where she shows you in a step-by-step -step fashion how she makes her way from the dream to actually embarking on that adventure. Cathy, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Great. I'm, I'm glad. It's really wonderful to be here. I did one presentation back in October. I had so much fun. Erica said, come do it again. And I jumped on the opportunity to share some of things that I've learned traveling uh, that I never knew I would know. Um, Ten years ago, I had no idea I would know all of this stuff that I know now because <laughs> of my traveling. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you if I can do it you correctly. Be able to, yep. There you go. It looks good, Luke. Yep, yep, looks share? great. Looks good. great. Okay, I, I have a different screen, so I'm always nervous about that. Um, so I will start this by saying that I'm going to be putting a bunch of links on the screen as we go through the presentation. So don't worry about taking notes because all the links are going to be included in a follow up email. Uh, so you don't have to keep trying to write down all those squiggly uh, uh, post titles. So today, obviously, I'm going to talk about independent travel. So here's a few things that I'm going to be covering. Um, I'm going to give you my definition of independent travel, and it's not necessarily solo travel. Uh, I'm going to talk about the advantages and the disadvantages of independent travel and how to decide if it's right for you. It's not for everyone, for sure. Uh, I'm going to give you a bunch of tips about becoming an independent travel traveler and uh, ways that you can overcome your apprehensions. Um, I'm going to tell you uh, why I don't use escorted tours, uh, or all inclusive tours very much. But I will also tell you when I do sometimes use a guide or a guided excursion. And then at the end, I'm going to give you a whole plethora of, of re uh, resources that you can use to go out and start working on the nitty gritty of your next independent travel adventure. So starting out, what is an independent traveler? And my definition kind of falls in this scenario. Most independent travelers like to choose their destinations and their itineraries based on their own interests. They like to do all or almost all of their own travel research on their own. Uh, sometimes they can get help. That's, there's not a rule about that. Um, they generally like to travel solo or just with a limited number of other like-minded people. Independent travel is great for families. Uh, and, and for friends who have the similar interests and similar ways to travel. Um, they generally like to engage with locals. Uh, here I am on a motorbike in Sri Lanka. Um, and they will stay, usually stay in one location longer than most uh, guided tours allow for. It's, it's usually independent travel tends to be a slower way of traveling than the get back on the bus, let's go to the next stop type of tour. Um, and they like to travel, tend to like to travel off the beaten track and find all those secret places. Here's one example in the Sacred Valley of Peru, which is one of the most touristy areas of Peru. And of course, one of the most fascinating ones. But this 
this trek, this little five, I think it was about five or six miles from the village of Chinchero down to the Urubamba River. I did this with one other woman and we did not see one person on that entire trek down to the river until we got down to the village at the bottom. Uh, I'm sorry, we saw one person. We saw a farmer, a local farmer, and that's it. So uh, you can really learn ways to find these little secret places and hidden places. I have a whole presentation I can do on some of the hidden places in the sacred valley, actually, because I found a, quite a few of them. Uh, independent travelers also like to do what we call living live locally. In other words, they like using public transportation. They find local stores, markets, and cafes that they will go to and then go back to and make friends with the owners of. Um, and uh, many times they are usually less interested in sightseeing, but they're more interested in getting to know the people and the culture where they go. For me, that is the most fascinating thing about traveling. Um, they generally only hire guides or go on guided excursions occasionally. And I'm gonna to talk to you some specific examples later on about when I do that. So let's talk about some of the advantages of independent travel. You get, like you said earlier, you get to choose when and where you want to go with a, uh, a guided tour. You have to stick with the tour. It's hard to move away from what they're doing, their itineraries. You can change your plans on a whim. If you find a special attraction to a location, you can decide to stay longer, or if you're disappointed, you can leave. It's up to you. Uh, you have the opportunity to make lasting friendships with locals and other travelers. In some ways, this has become a bit of a con for me because I have friends now all over the world and it gets very expensive to go back and visit them again. So, uh, so but it is a wonderful thing, opportunity you get to meet uh, and have authentic relationships with people. Another thing that helps with this, with meeting people, other travelers and uh, other people that are locally while you're traveling is to travel in a smaller group, either travel solo or maybe with one other person. You can save a great deal of money. You don't have to, if you want to, if you want to have a journey where you stay in nicer places, uh, you can do that. But if you're really needing to save money, which is my case, I tend to have to pretty much live in my, under the constraints of my social security. Um, you can, um, I spent two years traveling, as mentioned earlier, and this was the grand total of my cost, including all of my airfare and uh, lodging, uh, storage of a few things back home. I don't, I don't have a home to keep up with at, right, at all, but I did have to store things, my travel insurance, everything, my souvenirs, things that came up that I weren't, wasn't expecting. That's a, it's, I kind of challenge you to live in the United States at this, um, on this uh, budget. So um, and keep in mind that on an escorted tour, you're not, not likely to find an escorted tour that's going to be less than $100 a day, not including airfare. Um, you also have the opportunity to travel much more slowly um, and at your own at your own pace and see things stay in if you want to stay in a museum all day stay in it all day you've got all the time in the world you have the opportunity to get lost what i call lost uh i like to occasionally get off of the main streets in cities and walk a few blocks away i did this in porto portugal and i came up on this cemetery that i had never seen the likes of this anywhere it has little streets at the entrance to the cemetery there's a map with all the streets listed on it with names these are all the family mausoleums. It happened to be a very foggy day that day. It was kind of, an, it was right around Christmas time, actually. And uh, while I was walking in there, sometimes the, the cathedral bells would toll in the background. And I just felt like I was on a totally different planet. And I was just a few blocks off of the main drag in Porto. Um, it's also easy for you to take a day off from traveling. If you're with an escorted tour and you don't feel well, you can't take a day off or you might miss seeing like five or six different places that they visit that day. So those are some advantages. But if this sounds idyllic to you, there are disadvantages. Uh, you have to make all of your own travel arrangements. And this can mean that you spend hours on the computer looking at train, bus, flight schedules, deciding which is the best lodging choice. Um, but and if you're not a professional travel agent, this doesn't come quickly. At, especially at first. 
And it's easy to make a mistake. And you may not find out about that mistake until you walk into a lodging and find out, oh, I don't have a reservation. And I thought I had a reservation. So it's really easy to make a mistake. Uh, and I've made them before. And then you have to work that out. There are times when you can't make your plans work out. There may be one place you want to go. I don't, um, for example, I don't drive in other countries. And so I have to do everything on public transportation. And I have a, I'll find a place I really want to go. There was one place on the north of Scotland I really wanted to go. And I just couldn't make it work out because I couldn't make the public transportation work. One essential leg I couldn't make work out. And I had to start over from square one. Or maybe you might have to start on a completely different, something doing something completely different. There are language issues. You don't have a guide with you right on hand to translate for you. And on, on that same thing, you don't have a convenient guide that you can uh, turn to and ask questions of as they come up while you're traveling. Now, one way that you can get around that is save up your questions. And when you're back at your lodging or your guest house, ask your host the questions and ask them to explain things to you. And usually they're very happy to do that. Uh, but you don't have that guide right there in your pocket. And of course, you're probably not going to be able to visit as many places because those escorted tours, they have everything tightly set very tightly. That's the reason you have to get back on the bus so quickly. Uh, so um, there's pros and cons to that. It's nice you have the extra time, but you don't get to see as many places. So how do you decide if this is for you? Uh, there's, there's a few hard questions you need to ask yourself. Um, one is, do you enjoy researching and travel, doing travel plans on your own? Even it may take a couple of hours or more. I've been working on a trip from uh, uh, France to Georgia, uh, the country of Georgia, and I've been working on it for months. So you're going to spend a lot of time looking and trying to decide where all you want to go. It takes extra, a lot of extra time. Um, You've got to kind of have this attitude of planning a trip is almost as much fun as the trip itself. Um, you, uh, there's some, and then there's a few little skills you need. Are you good at reading and following instructions? Uh, are you comfortable reading and using a map? Now, granted, these days we have Google Maps. I love that little blue dot that always shows me where I am. But you need to be comfortable with uh, using maps because you're going to be do, finding your way on your own. And this is a tough question, and I'm not always sure what the answer for me is, but when things don't go as expected, what is your response? Are you flexible? Is it hard to calm down? Do you consider options right away? Um, one thing that I happened to me, and uh, I was leaving a, a Gili Air in Indonesia, and I had uh, plenty of time to take the boat. It's an island. I had to take the boat to the mainland of Indonesia, and then I had five, four long flight to Ecuador. And right off the bat, the boat broke down. And I thought all of my travel plans, it was a 50 hour journey, we're going to go awry. And I at first I go, I can panic or I can say, if this doesn't work out, I'm calling my insurance company. <laughs> but it all worked out. But there are times when things don't go as planned, and you need to be able to uh, respond to them on your own. Um, so I will say that detailed travel planning is not for everyone. And if this is the kind of thing that makes you crazy, there's nothing wrong with getting some help. I'm gonna give you some ideas for getting help at the end of the presentation. Uh, but it is helpful to have some basic travel planning skills in case you get stuck or something goes amiss. Uh, you can access, um, oh, another one is if you know how to think outside the box and that kind of goes along with things not going right. So I have um, a blog post that basically is covering most of the things that are in this presentation called DIY Travel. But if you go to that blog, post, uh, you, will, you can download a worksheet that will help you decide if independent travel is for you and give you specific ways to start planning your next independent journey. So here are a few tips for you. Uh, keep things simple and easy at first. Uh, com uh, one thing you can do, mainly I tell people, start out with a country or an area or, or that has a language or culture that's similar to yours if you've never done this before. Uh, if you have friends to your destination, ask for their advice about where to visit. Uh, maybe they'd even invite you to come and visit with them and they could show you around and then you could go out on your own. Um, if you do go on an escorted tour, 
uh, you, what you could do, you could take that all-inclusive tour and then add a few days onto your itinerary at the end of the tour and go back to some of the places that you wish you'd had more time for during the tour, or maybe you had some places that weren't included on the tour. But before you leave the tour, get your tour guide off to the side and start picking his brain about those places. You know, you may find out his cousin lives there and he says, oh, you got to go see my cousin when you get there. That is not unusual. Or they are usually very tickled that you want to see more of their country or more of their city. So pick your guide's brain about, tell them what you're thinking about doing. I'm going back uh, over to Batacaloa. Would you tell me, you know, the best way to get there? Could you recommend some things we might do there? Or how can I get back to that silk factory that we visited? I was really interested in seeing more of that and there wasn't enough time on the tour. So use your guide with you when you have it. To, um, breastfeed or mm -hmm. So um, the next thing you need to do is research, research, research. You want to Google the hell out of your location. For example, when I went to Mexico recently, I was going to Guanajuato and I just said, Goog I just Googled Guanajuato travel and I got a plethora of blog posts and videos by independent travelers telling me of things I wanted to see and things I didn't want to miss. The other thing that is helpful is if you book a homestay or a small guest house through a program like Airbnb. I have problems, some problems with Airbnb, but it's a good way to actually have a family homestay and be actually living in the home with the family because that's when you're going to get to get to know more locals and have more opportunities to really know the area that you're in. Um, and one thing that I also do, uh, well, I also tell my pe the people that are my hosts, they, these hosts are the ones that I first used Airbnb for in Arequipa, Peru. They have now become friends. I've spent a total of probably two and a half months at their house. I'm like a, like a sister-in-law that won't go away. Um, and they just were, were really excellent at showing me around. And the reviews on Airbnb or, and sometimes on booking will tell you how helpful the hosts are. So check and see how helpful the hosts are. That's a big, big number one thing I'm looking for when I book in, a, in lodging. I also tell my hosts the things that I'm interested in seeing or learning about. And for example, when I was uh, in a hostel in Ireland, I told this very friendly man that checked me into the hostel, he said, what are you here for? Because there's a national park and most people go there to trek. I also like to hike, but I said, I like to knit and I'm looking for other knitters. And oh, my mom knits and he introduced me to his mom. I went to her house, we knitted together. She and I went on a little excursion to, she arranged for me to see the uh, Lace Knitting Museum off season and have it opened up for me so that I could see all of the lace, uh, the Irish lace there. Uh, and it was just a wonderful experience and we're still friends on Facebook. So uh, you need to let your hosts know what you're uh, interested in. Another thing that my daughter and I were planning a trip to Morocco and we had a guest house picked out. We, I wrote to the host in advance a detailed letter, exactly what we were looking for and what our interests were. And he wrote back a really long letter with lots of suggestions. And he said, and when you get here, my wife can do this and we'll take you to the local hammam and blah, 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 blah. And I will say it was really too bad that COVID forced us to cancel that trip. So um, there are things that you definitely don't want to forget that an agency will help remind you of and they or they will do for you. And one is always check your passport expiration date if you're going to another country. Very few countries will let you in. If you do not have at least six months left on your passport from the time that you enter the country. In fact, you won't even be allowed on the plane. Uh, you need to be sure about your visa requirements for every country. I always check that early on because I don't want any, um, I don't want any um, surprises to find out at the last minute that, oh, I'm going there, but my visa cost $150 or whatever. You want to know all that stuff in advance. And you can use the, you, you can go to the, um, usually go to the, um, your, your embassy, the embassy's websites, or you can just Google it. What's the visa requirements for this country? Uh, you want to check all the vaccination requirements. And I'm not just talking about COVID. Uh, 
it's a good idea if you get a travel consult with your doctor to find out what things you need, especially if you're going to some uh, de developing countries. Uh, look at things like typhoid fever, yellow fever. Some countries won't let you in unless you have proof that you have don't ha aren't a carrier of yellow fever. Uh, and yes, rabies are considerations in some countries. And by the way, you know, check to see if your tetanus shot is up to date. So those are some things you don't want to forget that an agency might remind you of. So I'm often asked, aren't you afraid to travel? Are you ever afraid? Uh, and I, here's a few things that I think can help you to overcome some of your apprehensions. One is I tell myself that our fears are mostly illusions. Uh, what is scary for one person is perfectly normal for another. For example, how many of you get into your automobile regularly, fasten your seatbelt, and drive onto an expressway? That is probably one of the most dangerous things many of us do on a daily basis, but we don't have a lot of fear about it. So um, think about those kinds of things and really look at look at what is realistic. Uh, I do have fears are kind of some reticence sometimes when I travel, but the alternative is not to travel. So you, you kind of have to take steps to deal with that. And that's my next thing to talk about is take things step by step. Uh, if you want some inspiration for this topic, I recommend that you go to my blog post, um, which is called A Ship in the Harbor is Safe. And it will tell you how on my first day in Peru, I was afraid to walk out of my guest house and how I overcame that. And in a couple of weeks after that, I was planning my own independent excursion to Lake Titicaca in the middle of the Festival of Valeria, which is Peru's carnival. So I, I say my motto for people is take the next step out of your comfort zone. Don't try to do everything at once, but take it one step at a time. And that's what the blog post, The Ship in the Harbor is Safe, is all about. Uh, you can read articles about your destination by other independent travelers. Uh, I ended up in Kyrgyzstan. Actually, this is the reason I ended up in Kyrgyzstan. I read a blog post on my travel insurance's site, uh, which is World Nomads, um, about uh, called five reasons you should go to Kyrgyzstan. I had never heard of Kyrgyzstan. I didn't know if it wasn't safe. I had no idea what the currency was. I had no idea about Kyrgyzstan at all. And this blog post sent me there. And um, I figured, well, it must be safe if my travel insurance company is writing a blog post about it. So, and I, I just figured they wouldn't send me any place it wasn't safe. Uh, and another thing you can do while you're traveling is ask locals about areas that might be unsafe. They can tell you the neighborhoods to stay out of, uh, especially in the evening. Again, you're going to research in advance. Uh, making your travel plans for arrival is pretty important. Um, the most times when I'm the most Apprehensive is when that plane lands and I go, okay, I got to get through immigration. I got to get deal with taxis, blah, blah, blah. But if before I go on the trip, I make a plan uh, like this one, and it tells me exactly, in this case, this was how to take a bus from the airport in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, all the way to the stop that was closest to my um, lodging. And I mapped this out and I stored it on my phone so that I could access it really easily when I got to the airport. And I knew exactly where to, because I did my research, I knew exactly where to meet the marshutka, which is what they call a bus in Kyrgyzstan. And I, another thing that I do is I will go to Google Maps Street View, yay, and look at the, um, what it's going to look like when I, I got, went to the best stop where this bus was going to let me out so I could see what the landmarks look like. So when I got to that bus stop and got off the bus, I immediately knew I had to turn right and start walking. And I knew which direction to go. I knew what I, to expect. And I knew that this was the place I was supposed to be when I saw all these landmarks. So this gave me a lot of, it gives you a lot of confidence as you're entering the place. And the other thing it did for me in Bishkek was that when I, emerged from immigration into the uh, arrival hall, the taxi drivers all attacked me, like they all wanted my business. 
And I was able to go, oh, I'm going on the Marshika. <laughs> and one even tried to tell me that it was dangerous to go on the Marshika. And I had, my research told me that it wasn't dangerous. And I did. And I, I ended up spending like 50 cents to go like 20 miles into Bishkek. And my taxi would have been no telling how much. So you can really save money, but also have that wonderful experience of living like a local. And then you ask yourself, what is the worst that can happen? Um, and sometimes I, I say, tell people sometimes that if anything that I worry about isn't going to happen. So go ahead and worry about it because then that won't happen. But uh, it also helps if you don't kind of discount anything that's absolutely not going to happen. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in Arequipa. There's like three volcanoes there. Not likely they're going to blow up. They could, but they're not. So that's like you need to be realistic. But um, the the one thing that um, one thing that need to happen for me is I'll get on a bus and when I get to my I, I get lost. I get off the bus. I go, where the heck am I? I have no idea where I am. I don't know how to get back on the bus. What bus do I take? Nobody speaks English. The worst that can happen. And I go, well, I could take a I can find a taxi and get back to my lodging. So the worst that can happen is I get on the wrong bus. I can get back where I need to be because I know I have a card that says my where my lodging is and I can just show it to the taxi driver. So you may be asking, okay, Kathy, what's your problem with escorted tours? So I've probably mentioned already kind of been alluding to this all along, but the main thing uh, is, that independent travelers don't do is join a packaged tour. Um, I decide for me, uh, one of the main reasons I don't is because they are so expensive. Like I said earlier, you're not going to find a package tour that's going to be less than about $100 a day. And they're not going to include a lot of some of your meals. They are not going to include your airfare. And most of the time, if they say that it's a 10-day tour, uh, they usually count the day that you arrive and the day that you leave, but they don't, you're not doing anything on those days. So really it's an eight-day tour. So keep that in mind. They also usually provide lodging and meals that I consider expensive. And sometimes you are in, they pay the sometimes hefty admissions to some sites that maybe I don't have any interest in. And there are also at the same time, there's several middlemen that are getting a cut of your the money that you're giving them. Uh, the other thing is uh, you don't get a chance to have much authentic interaction with local people if you're on a, an escorted tour. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, the main reasons that I travel. Uh, my main problem, uh, as mentioned before, is that you don't have much say so in the schedule. Uh, for example, I took a one day escorted tour to Northern Ireland because I was short on time and I wanted to see uh, the, the, the Devil's Causeway, but I remember seeing, we were left off the bus and we came to this beautiful hiking trail and I could have explored the wild coast of Northern Ireland all day, but alas, the tour guide says, be back on the bus in an hour. And I didn't have time to do this wonderful trip. But then there are times, as this example shows you, when I do use escorted tours. Uh, I use them if they're well, they have to be well recommended, usually by locals, or I've read blog posts or reviews about them. Uh, I do go on a lot of city, free city walking tours. These are great opportunities to visit uh, a new location and get an idea, kind of a the land and a chance to pick the guide's brain. And one thing that I've done before is um, at the end of the free walking tour, you generally are expected to give some gratuity to the guide based on how good the guide was and what you can afford to pay. I usually pay somewhere between eight and $15, depending on the tour. Um, and, uh, but one thing that I did once was I, at the end of the tour, asking him so many questions and all the other people had left and I said, can I, can I buy you a beer? And would you like give me some more information? We ended up going to a local pub and I got a lot more information from that guide. And in fact, a better place, a better hostel to stay in than what I was in. So uh, that's an opportunity for you. Generally, uh, they have to be short, these tours, most three or four days. Uh, and they have to be a small group. I don't want some gigantic bus. And here's some examples of when I have used uh, escorted tours. If it is, there is a specific theme, 
subject or place that I want to go. For example, this was a trip I took to uh, organic uh, coffee and cacao farms in Peru. And it was really would have been really challenging to get to those places from the Sacred Valley where I was living. Uh, and this was a two day, it was only a two day tour. We had a guide and they, uh, it was a very experiential tour. We picked coffee beans. We learned how both the coffee and the cacao are processed. We made our own coffee for breakfast the next morning and we um, actually created some cacao paste, uh, which was really delicious. Uh, and so we had this really wonderful experience. And I think there were four other people on that tour. So it was very intimate uh, as well as uh, um, short and interesting. And it had a specific uh, theme all the way through. I also have used a, a guide when the going is tough. This is a this is a trail that along the two day trip trek to uh, it's a four day trek actually two days in two days out to the ruins of Choque Corral, which is a sister site to Machu Picchu, but mo many people don't even know about it. When we got to Choque Corral, there were five of us, including the guide, at the site. Period. There was nobody else at the site. And we had it all to ourselves, and the sun was setting. It was beautiful. It was not Machu Picchu. It was a completely different place. But you do, this is a tough hike it, for me. It was uh, basically the same as hiking into the Grand Canyon and out and back in and back out in four days. But we had uh, the, the tour company gave, provided all of our meals. They set up our tents at the end of the day. We only had, we, all of our, uh, everything was carried on horseback. So all we had to carry was a small day pack with a few things we wanted during the day with our water, et cetera, et cetera. And we had a guy that uh, gave us very intimate uh, uh, experiences. Uh, and it, as it turned out, our guide happened to have been raised right here in this valley. So uh, you can get some really wonderful experiences uh, by using a guide sometimes. The other time I have, uh, sometimes I will hire a translator. This is the animal market in, Bish in uh, Karakal in uh, Kyrgyzstan. And mostly only people there are people that are trading animals, but I wanted to go visit it. So I hired a young college student uh, in the town who spoke English and he was able to ask, he didn't know that much about the market. So he wasn't really a guide, but he was able to ask questions for me of the farmers and the people that were there. Uh, so that's another use of a guide. And sometimes there is just no other way to get to an area. Uh, there are places uh, in Peru's uh, rainforest that outsiders are not allowed unless they have a certified guide with them. So I took a four day trip into the jungle of Peru with a guide and it was great because she was a naturalist and she was able to point out things that we didn't see until she pointed them out. And uh, it very, again, it was kind of fairly focused on the nature of this part of these are the, head, these are the headwaters of the Amazon River. So those are some places where I have tried to uh, use a guide. I try to book them locally uh, using recommendations. Booking locally usually puts more of the money in the pockets of the local economy too. So that's my experiences with guides. And having said all this, there are some benefits to escorted tours. And there's an excellent article about this. Here is the blog post I wrote. Uh, and again, that's going to be in the follow-up email. So here, uh, I know I'm running through things very quickly, but I'm going to do a few resources so that afterwards you can go and find more information about this and learn how to do this yourself. Um, I mentioned, let's see. So this blog post that I have, the steps I take on the road to a reservation, uh, if you want to learn about the nitty gritty of how I make planning step by step, this is a great, great place to get you started. Um, and uh, I know that many of you attended this presentation to get some of this nitty gritty information. So I'm gonna give you a quick synopsis of what is covered in this blog post. One is that uh, I always check, log check for lodging first. It sounds a little backwards, but um, you can easily find out once you arrive in a town or you're getting ready to make your lodging, maybe at the last minute, oh, 
there's no lodging. How come there's no lodging? Oh my gosh, this is the weekend of a major music festival. There's no place I can afford to be here. Uh, oh, I've already got my reserva my airline reservation or my train reservation. Go check to see if there is lodging first and there's lodging that you would like to stay in. Um, then I, um, I use uh, booking.com for a lot of my reservations. And the nice thing about that is that you can make the reservations and then you can usually cancel them almost up until the day of travel. I did this recently because we thought we were going to France in February. Uh, COVID had different ideas and I had a really cheap, really nice place to stay right in the heart of Paris for a couple of nights so we could get over our jet lag. And I went ahead and made the reservations and then I just recently had to cancel them. But I did that first to make sure that I had a place, a bed to sleep in when I got there. Then uh, decide how you're going to travel. Oh, I'll tell you some of the ways I use uh, these. This is all in this blog post, but these are some of the ways that I uh, book. I use booking.com and agoda.com a lot. If I'm doing uh, if I want a guest house with a family homestead, I usually check with Airbnb. Um, I'm not using it as much as I used to, but that is another way to uh, get a, a more intimate experience. Um, and if I'm staying in hostels, which I do a lot in Europe, because it's really the only way I can afford to stay to visit Europe, I use high hostels or hostel world. Although these days, booking.com has a lot of hostels listed in it as well. I could spend a whole day on how to choose a place to stay, but we will go on to deciding how to travel. The next thing you need to figure out uh, is how you're going to get to where you're going. Uh, when I am... I, I recently wrote a huge rant about airline reservations, and many of you can identify with that. Uh, there, we use aggregators, Kiwi and Skyscanner. I have a love-hate relationship with them, uh, but oftentimes I kind of cheat. I find, go to the aggregators, I find out which airlines are, have the tickets, uh, and then I go and try to book with the airline. The, the problem with that, because you use two different airlines and you miss your second flight because the first flight was delayed, you could end up in a really costly mess. So those are things you need to consider uh, if you don't use an aggregator. Because usually the aggregators like Kiwi, it will guarantee your connection even if you miss your flight. But then I have also discovered that you get challenge getting hold of them when you're in the middle of transit airport somewhere in the world. So again, pros and cons. For train uh, or bus travel, I usually check with roamtorio.com uh, and it gives you an idea of the possible routes and ways to find websites that will take, they will take you to websites where you can buy, actually buy your tickets or learn uh, more about those routes. Uh, before I book any train tickets, I always choose uh, seat61.com. I have fallen in love with this site I because I love train travel uh, and it's it is an amazing place. It is kept well updated. I absolutely recommend it for planning any train, train travel anywhere in the world, but especially in Europe. And, and they even cover some ferry boats as well. But they will show you exactly what it's going to be like, what kind of train uh, reservations you're going to, what kind of uh, carriers you're going to be on, et cetera. And then, of course, uh, use Google Maps, as I mentioned earlier. So um, you want to also plan how to travel from the airport to your lodging, which I talked about earlier. Um, and more information is in that uh, blog post about that. And you want to collect all your information in one place so that you can easily find it when you're traveling. I usually put everything on my phone and then I have links on the uh, front of my phone that I can easily get. To. For example, here I have my itinerary and directions in this folder. I keep all my confirmations uh, on readily available and all of my tickets, e-tickets and boarding passes are also there so that I can get to them without having to think. And if I have any e-visas, I also have those there as well. So if you want, if, if that's not enough details, uh, if you want even more details, as Luke mentioned earlier, I have um, uh, mentioned, oh, let me, Put this in there, I almost forgot. So this blog post, trip planning uh, techniques, 
actually shows you an example of how I use all of that information that's in the Road to Reservation article in, uh, in, an, in a specific example of uh, traveling from San Sebastian, Spain to the Netherlands in one day. So if you want even more, 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 more details, uh, as Luke mentioned earlier, I've written uh, a, um, a series of posts about how I'm planning this overland journey from Paris to Georgia. And I nicknamed the series, Look Over My Shoulder, because I sometimes am asked by people if they can just watch while I make my trip plans. It's very, very detailed. There's lots of links to booking resources. And I share lots of documents like these that help me keep myself organized, calendars, spreadsheets, uh, a Word document where I keep all the, my information in. This is really useful. Uh, this series is really useful if you're planning a very long trip or a multi-country trip that has a lot of details to it. And then if you just go to my website, you can see all of my travel how-to articles. Uh, there's one that I really like a lot if you're considering uh, staying in hostels, but you've never stayed in a hostel before. I wrote a, a blog post called Hostels, They're Not Just for 20-something. So um, you will find a lot more information about solo travel, uh, experiential travel, thematic travel uh, in my travel how-to list. So... Becoming an independent traveler can be really challenging at first, but I tell you what, the rewards are so worth it. Uh, remember that it's a step-by-step -step process, and the more you travel, uh, the more independent and adventurous you're going to become. So I have a couple special offers for you. I'm really excited that uh, to be collaborating with another nomadic mat um, person. I saw her presentation in December about the Balkans and I got in contact with her and we've talked several times. She is a guru travel planner and a consultant. If you're new to independent travel and you like a little bit of handholding, Annie is the person for you. Uh, she's very friendly. She's inspiring. She's fun to work with. She loves travel planning. Um, and she's offering uh, viewers of this presentation a 60-minute free consultation. And this uh, link will be in the follow-up email, but you can go to this link and uh, she, will, um, she will be glad to help you out. You'll be glad you met Annie. Uh, I will have to say, I think I have to disclose that if you hire Annie as a result of watching this presentation, that I may receive a commission. I think I have to say that. <laughs> So as mentioned in the introduction, another offer I have for you is uh, to my book, Dream Plan Travel, in which I, again, I have lots of details about uh, traveling slowly, independently, how I travel long-term on a budget, very tight budget. Um, and so these are some of the chapters in the book. There's lots of stories and examples uh, in the book, as well as ideas for making your travel more special for you. There's also lots of links in the book to downloadable enhanced content like planning worksheets, lists, uh, pertinent blog posts that can be useful, and a budgeting spreadsheet, as well as how to use the spreadsheet. You can um, learn more about the book here, kathleensodyssey.com slash dpt. Uh, and including you can read the introduction to the book and see the table of contents. The book is available in hard copy um, through uh, any almost online any online uh, bookstore as well as your favorite you go to your favorite bookstore and order it from them. Uh, however, if you'd like to get it right away and a lot cheaper, you can order the ebook, which is a PDF version of the book. It's the same thing. Uh, and uh, you can go to this same site, uh, my DPT site, use the coupon code TNN-independent, and uh, it will give you the book for half, the downloadable ebook for half price, and you can get it immediately. Half price is $8. Uh, and you're free to share this uh, code with your friends, uh, but I will tell you it's only valid until February the 1st. So as I talked about earlier, uh, my mom used to say that planning a trip is almost as much fun as the trip itself. And over the years, I have really discovered that this is really true. Uh, even when I don't end up going on a trip sometimes, I never felt like I wasted time and dreaming and planning. 
So I hope this presentation has given you a few ideas to make your trip planning fun and productive. Um, and I, I thank you a lot for joining me. I know I've gone through this really quickly, so uh, I'm open it. Luke, maybe maybe has some questions available oh, for us. So so many questions. That was amazing, Kathy. Fantastic. I'll wow. Take my <laughs> share. I'll stop my share so I can see people. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we we peaked at 140 people on the call today, which I think is the busiest wonderful. I've ever seen one of these. Um, and we had people from all over the States, Canada, all across Europe. Um, I know there's people watching in Africa and Asia as well. So absolutely a proper international audience, which is fantastic. Yeah. I've got a lot of questions to go through through now that that we've that, that people have put up. There are several questions um, that people asked that were quite similar. So I'm going to sort of ask them as one. So a, so if that makes sense to you, yeah. don't be, okay. you know, if you don't hear your question exactly the way you, you asked it. Um, sorry about that, but we can't ask similar questions. You can't ask six or seven of the same questions, you know. Um, so the first one here, and this was this was asked by several people, was was to do with travel insurance. And some people were asking for specific companies or specific tips with that. And I think it's probably better to keep that keep that quite broad. You know, what do you do with that? Do you book do, do you book a specific um, policy per trip, or do you have an annual one that you that you go under? Is it difficult to 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 book travel insurance? Is it something that you that you that you found challenging? I haven't found it challenging, but I do use World Nomads almost exclusively. And most people that do a lot of uh, big traveling use uh, World Nomads because um, I just feel I'm really well covered. They really, and they really are working with people that do long, I travel long term. And mm. uh, many insurance companies won't cover you uh, for more than like 30 days, 60 days at the most. World Nomads will tra uh, cover you for six months at a time at, and then you have to renew and they let me renew while I'm on the road. I've renewed several times at <laughs> two year journey. Um, uh, it does, the more the more places you go, especially if you, the more places you go, the more expensive it is, but they'll give you, you get a free quote uh, online from them and see how much it is. The problem is, is that, um, uh, as we age, I know that this was this was titled uh, "Seniors Traveling Independently," so I'm assuming that a lot of people here are getting past 65 and 70. And depending on what country you're in, it can be more of a challenge. But what I'm finding is insurance companies that a few years ago were not offering insurance for people over 70, you just couldn't find it. Um, they're opening up because us baby boomers were growing up and we have money and we, you know, they found a market and then I'm seeing more and more insurance companies are offering for older people traveling. So, no, that, but World that Nomads makes... is my go-to because I feel confident that they're going to cover everything I need. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's different for every person, isn't it? It's it dependent on your age and your circumstances and the country in which you live and all of these sorts of things. I think you need to do uh, the but research don't travel yourself. without it. Yeah, Don't absolutely. Travel that, without it. That's important. And a bit more of a specific question from someone here about traveling with osteoporosis, particularly in relation to doing the Camino. Um, how rigorous is that on, on you physically? You know, is that something you can do with, with, with certain conditions that perhaps would make you, you know, certain conditions that would make movement more difficult? I have seen people on the Camino, it will move your heart doing it in all kinds of ways. I see my friend Annie from Bristol is there, here. She is my Camino guru. Uh, she has done like, I think nine Caminos or something like that. But, uh, and I, she can uh, confirm this, that there are so many ways to do the Camino. I've seen people blind. I've seen uh, the oldest woman I saw was in her eighties. Um, yeah. yeah. The nice, the one thing, there's so many ways to do the Camino. And I have a whole series of blog posts on the Camino that you can uh, read on my website as well, my day-by-day -day journey. But um, it, there, there are ways that you can travel and just carry uh, like a day pack and then have your lunch sent around to each, to each mm. of your uh, destinations each day. So you don't have to carry as much. Uh, there is a wonderful site. Uh, it's called uh, my, oh, I can't remember it right offhand. Don't it's, yet. Anyway, it's a forum. I could I could add it to the to the email later. But there's a forum 
uh, that you can go to to get all kinds of information like that detailed information. Like you could say, I am traveling with osteoporosis. I'm planning to do the Camino and I can guarantee you you can have other people that have had the same issue to answer your questions for you. Yeah, no, that makes sense a lot. And I think, I, yeah, it's, I've heard of people doing it all sorts of ages and conditions with some, some people taking trolleys and things like this so they don't have to carry their bags and all sorts of, all sorts of different contraptions and, and, and that sort of thing. A question about a bit of sort of COVID anxiety here. So, uh, one, one viewer says that they um, would like to do some more flying but are, uh, to more travel, but are worried about things sort of not being back to normal or not being you know, not being as they'd like them to be when they when they reach their destination. Is that something that concerns you, that worries you, that perhaps you'll get to X place and it will be <laughs> locked down halfway through or it won't be as, as whole, remembered five years whole, ago? Yeah, there's a whole continuum there. You know, you have to yeah. look at what your fears are. It's it's just like, you know, some people here won't still won't even go out of their home. So it's like this whole continuum of people. Then there's people that like don't even never wear a mask, blah, blah, blah. So so it's hard to answer that question, but I will say I went to Mexico in the middle of the COVID because I just wanted a cheaper place to live for a while, but I stayed in one place and I didn't go out. I wasn't really a tourist. I was actually living there for a while. I am planning a trip. Um, I'm not too concerned about the flights. Uh, I think you're going to be, as long as you don't have, the flights don't bother me. I'm going to be, I'm going to be uh, exposed to COVID at some point anyway, no matter what I do. But um, I guess I think what a lot of people are concerned, they're going to get stuck somewhere. That's where your travel mm. insurance comes in. I've heard lots of stories of people that were really glad they had travel insurance when COVID hit because they got it, their their trip would have cost them like four thousand dollars to get home and their travel insurance covered it. So that is a good reason to have travel insurance. If your concern is from along the long lines of getting stuck somewhere or if you come down with COVID and you need to be brought home to be taken care of. Um, that kind of thing. Another thing that travel insurance companies offer is a concierge service. So no matter what your problem is, you can call them and say, I need to find a dentist right now. My tooth just fell out or something. You know, you can get help from them. So um, I think uh, we are, my daughter and I right now have another tentative date to go to the Balkans in March, but oh, we're, instead of going to a whole bunch of countries, we're narrowing it down to maybe two countries. So we don't have to deal with the restrictions. When you get to the border, this, this country needs this, this country needs that, and it'll about drive you mm. nuts. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I hope that answers that question. No, it does. Exactly. I think it's an easy, it's an easy worry to have, isn't it? At, at the moment. I know I've, I've yeah. certainly have. And, and the, the person actually mentioned Scotland when I was there a week ago and it was fine. You know, it was, it was just as it is. I would go to Scotland be, tomorrow. I would go to Scotland tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I, I would as well. It was beautiful. Um, okay, okay. Do you have, this is a question that came up a couple of times. Do you have then a place that you call home? I know you said you're in New Orleans at the moment. Have you, have you got things that you, that you keep in a certain place or are you truly backpack living, you know? No, I have a few. I still have a few things, mostly like keepsakes. Uh, my brother-in-law is wondering if I'm going to get them out of his garage. <laughs> my sister said, no, you can keep them there. Um, so I do have a handful of things. I'll fit on one pallet. That's about all I have. I've narrowed down. I got rid of everything. Uh, it was hard to do, but once I did it, it was just completely liberating. Um, mm. I've accumulated things in New Orleans. I've been here since uh, 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 August, but it's not any, nothing here that is terribly, you know, that I've held on to. I do one thing that is valuable for long-term travels or long-term nomads is to have a mailing address because people need, you're always needing a mailing address. And I use my sister's and she's, she's a great, she's really well organized. She's like, she's already an administrative assistant by trade. So she's really good at, if I get anything, contacting me, do you need this? Is this important? Whatever. Uh, and then I have a, a, a place that I can say, in fact, when I sign up for insurance, I have to have a location mm on my insurance where I'm from and I use her address. So a lot of people find a, a relative or someone they trust. Uh, I have used also in the past, I've used a friend uh, for that. Uh, and then I also give them access to my bank account so that if for any reason somebody needs to, um, to, to, do, to do anything with my money, I have more than one person to deal with my bank account. So. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. It's a good thing to have in, in, in order if you're going away for a long period of time, certainly. An interesting question period. here about um, 
this this person runs intergenerational activities groups and loves it they say when older and younger people do anything together can you share with us a an example of uh, fun experiences you've had of meeting travelers of different ages especially in the context of hosteling now i think yes. that's an interesting one because hostels you do get the you do get the impression of very young travelers don't you sort of rocking up there being noisy coming in at all hours you know yes. <laughs> and that's where i recommend people read that article the hostels aren't just for 20 somethings and i've had the most amazing experiences especially in the uk with hostels now i don't i don't go to city hostels i i i talk in that blog post about I don't care about party hostels and people being drunk and stuff like that but I talk in that article about how you can avoid those hostels and find the ones my friend Annie is also a big hostel person uh and I and I but uh, there's some wonderful hostels that are in like rural areas you just walk out the hostel door you start trekking I've stayed in one for two weeks in the Yorkshires uh I stayed in Oban Scotland one I think the lady that ran it didn't think I was ever going to leave uh, because I used it as a way to just, it was in the middle of the winter and I was able to just go down the West Highland way this way and come back and stay overnight in a warm bed and then go a different direction. And it was wonderful. But I also met people from all over the world for all ages. I met people that were 80 years old from Australia and I met young people that said, you know, they kind of look at me askance sometimes. And then, but the most wonderful things that have has happened to me, I think three or four times, People say, these young people will say, I hope I'm doing what you're doing when I'm your age. And it just makes me feel wonderful. Like, oh my gosh, I'm just killing it. You, know? <laughs> you are so, 100%. Yeah, it's just, it's really uh, wonderful. And the other, the problem with it is, is you're going to meet someone that's going to say, you've got to come to my country. And so that's mm -hmm. how I ended up in Sri Lanka, for gosh sakes, <laughs> or uh, we're getting ready to go to um, Serbia, and I was really excited because some friends, uh, I met some people in a hostel in Estonia who were from Serbia, and they shared with some of their rakia with me, and they said, if you come to Serbia, you can drink this all the time. <laughs> so uh, you'll have some really, you will end up with many more additions to your bucket list, as well as people to meet. And Yeah, and yeah meet again I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely yeah. right. So with that in mind, then you talk there about sort of travels changing as you go. Do you book a return flight when you go somewhere? Do you just book the first leg and then leave the second sort of leg open, ready to go? And if so, does that give you issues with visas and these sorts of things? What's your strategy? Well, I'm a slow traveler and I will go someplace and I will say like when I went to Kyrgyzstan, I said, I'm going to stay there about five weeks, not so many else, I don't know. And so I, but then a few weeks before I decide to go, I think, and then I said, and I think I'm going to go to India for a few weeks. So I, before a few weeks, you know, I went, I'm in Kyrgyzstan, then I booked my flight to India and then I booked my flight to Sri Lanka. But I, because I stay one place so long, I have plenty of time to make the decisions about the next stage of my trip. Uh, if, mm. if I were just doing something much shorter, I would, um, I probably would have my return flight booked or things like that. I, I wouldn't go anywhere outside of the United States or outside of my country if I had to, if I had to be gone less than two weeks. And two weeks, you know, is short for me. But um, I do know that you can get a cheap, much, you, sometimes you can get things much cheaper if you do a round trip ticket. Uh, but so you have to judge that. But then you're stuck with that round trip ticket unless it's, you know, flexible. Mm. So. Mm. No, that's absolutely right. I'm just going to actually put your your socials link in the chat because I can see I think a couple of people need to head off for other appointments and I want them to um I want everyone to connect with you because there's other questions that are coming up here so I I think that's important before we head on to the next one. There we go. They're there. So before you before you head off and do anything there's a couple more questions to go. We're not finished just yet, but if you do need to head off before you do, make sure you head over to Kathy's website there, her Facebook group, um, her book link and the YouTube link are there as well. And all of the links we shared in the presentation will come to you via email when we're done. So you'll get the, the book discount code and all of those things. And, and I assume, Kathy, that in those in, in those articles are all the links, you know, Airbnb and Hostel World and all those yes. sorts of things that you yes. that you recommend. There's all links. 
Perfect. And so we don't need to, to see the slides, basically, because it's all in those articles. Yes, it's all in those articles. And feel free to email me and ask me questions. I like to answer questions. I can't do like detailed travel planning. That's why I gave Annie's uh, name name to you because she's doing it for a business. I can't do that. I just don't want to do that. I'm retired. <laughs> but <laughs> I will do? help you with little with little questions that you have along the line for sure. Just just out of interest, what did you do before being retired? Uh, well, um, I've done a lot of things, but I homeschooled my kids uh, for 20 some odd years. Uh, and then I, uh, but I was a graphic designer, I guess I, I'm a book designer. I like to, I do the layouts for books, but I have been an administrative assistant um, and done a lot of other things like that. But my last right. job, in fact, I have a job coming up where I'm going to be doing a book layout for an old client, but I'm mostly retired at this point. Yeah. Cool. Um, one question or a couple of questions about technology. So do you take a computer or a tablet with you? How do you access the internet whilst you're traveling? Where do you save important documents? You use like a sky drive or a cloud drive or something like that? Yeah, I, I've, been a, I've been working on computers since the 80s. I work for a computer company, so I'm very comfortable with computers. So I can't say that's for everybody. And I also do a lot of my creativity. I love to edit YouTube videos. I love to uh, make these blog posts and make them as, as you know, picture a lot of pictures as much as possible, share my stories. So I do carry a small laptop with me. Uh, and um, I uh, on my last trip, I carried my tablet. I didn't have a phone for all of that trip uh, because I just didn't want to get a SIM card for every country. I think in coming times, I will have access to a phone. I think it's kind of a safety thing that I can get, you know, I can get help if I need it. But also it's nice to be able to have Wi-Fi available. Wi-Fi is very ubiquitous. I get excellent. I've been on this little tiny island of Gili Air in Indonesia and I had excellent Wi-Fi. I haven't been a place where I've had really, really bad Wi-Fi. Um, and not, and usually it's almost all lodging that I have been in, had, the Wi-Fi has been really good. So I, that's not a problem finding Wi-Fi anymore. It's everywhere. Yeah, I found that. Particularly in Asian countries, I found the Wi-Fi to be amazing, like better than we have in Europe. You know, it's everywhere. You know? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's really. And, and I just thought it was real interesting to see in some of these really very, very remote places. Yes. I've been in a bus in, in Peru and the way in the mountains, there's little Quechua women just talking on their phone blah, 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 because they never had landlines. You know, it's just like the technology just jumped over and they're very comfortable using their cell phones. Yeah, absolutely. And a final question, which I think, oh, um, a final question here, if you've got any more that you want to just jump in the comments, we can get to them. But I think this is a nice one that, that I'd, I'd really like to ask um, from, from someone who's particularly inspired. And I think there's a lot of people on this call who are inspired today. What would be your, your number one destination recommendation for someone to travel alone for the first time? So someone sitting here, watching you and they want to go, where would be that first plane ticket for them to, to travel to, do you think? Since I'm assuming everyone here speaks English and maybe for many of us, it's our main, I haven't, I say I have enough Spanish to get myself in trouble, but that's about it. Uh, <laughs> it's nice to go someplace where they speak your language. So I'm assuming everybody here speaks English, but you want to do a little bit of step out of your comfort zone. I would suggest anywhere, almost anywhere in Western Europe, but uh, start out in the UK. Go to Scotland. Scotland is amazing. That's my go. If somebody said, if you, money were no object and you could live anywhere in the world for the rest of your life, Scotland, that would be it. That's where I would go. Uh, but Scotland is wonderful. But they also sometimes they don't speak English the way we do. <laughs> you feel like you're in a foreign country, especially I was in the Outer Hebrides and nobody, they speak Gaelic out there. They don't speak English to each other, but they all know English. So you'll get to some, there's some wonderful places in Scotland that, and Ireland that are kind of remote, but the culture is familiar. So I usually say, start with a culture that you're familiar with so you can get used to the whole, you know, the whole travel planning stuff at the same time. And then you can reach out from there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, oh, someone's a couple of comments jumping in saying, where in Scotland to go specifically would you like to go? <laughs> I would like to go, uh, I would go anywhere in the Highlands which is a lot of Scotland. Uh, I would love to go back to the Outer Hebrides. I only had 10 days in the Outer Hebrides and I would like to walk the length of the Outer Hebrides wow, that, yeah. because I do love to hike in remote areas. I spent quite a bit of time also in the Shetland Islands because I was looking for knitters and spinners and sheep. 
there's a lot of sheep in Scotland. Yes. A lot of sheep. <laughs> so by, by definition, there should be a lot of knitters as well. Kathy, this was absolutely fantastic. I know there's a, I, I've seen a couple more questions come in, but a lot of them are very specific now, like asking. So, so I think if you've asked a question that's quite specific, you're probably better contacting Kathy directly and having a conversation with her yeah. about it. And she, she has said she's more than happy for you to do that rather than, me share your question with a hundred people and, and and her give an answer that's that's sort of just for you <laughs> thank you all I'm happy to answer a question if i don't know the answer i'll probably refer you over to annie but i'm i'm happy i'm i want to inspire people to travel i believe that if more of us travel if everybody had to travel outside their comfort zone for six months we would be on an avenue to world peace and that is yeah. really a belief that I have. And I think that if we can get more people to travel, especially young people, uh, we would be a much better planet. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Right. right. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you.